live from Silicon Valley in this Zoom salon with Mark Prensky. Mark, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to be here. There are people from all over the world. This is the title I'm going to talk about, which is the title of my new book that I'm just finishing up now. It's called Empowerment, The New Journey for the World's Young People. It's a 20-year look at the future. It's not the vision of tomorrow or even 10 years like the OECD. It's a 20-year horizon. I've thought about these ideas in both depth and breadth. Today, we're going to focus on breadth. I'm going to go through a lot. I encourage you to write to me. And if any of you wants to see a PDF of the book, I'm happy to send it to you in exchange for feedback. This is part of what I call the 2 Billion Kids Project. That's roughly the number of young people in the world. I'm trying to figure out ways that we can help all of them. What I'm going to talk about is reframing, which is seeing things in a new way. Reframing is really important to do because we operate so much in the frames that we grew up in in the 20th century, especially the adults who are all from the 20th century, that it's really important to take a different look at these things. And I think that young people in general are doing this. I'm going to share a number of reframes. You can take a screenshot if you want. I'll show it again at the end. I'm going to show you a map of all these. We're going to go through the things first on the left, in the center, on the right, and this will guide you as we go through. So reframing the coming world. A lot of people have talked about the world. They've given it names, the fourth industrial revolution, the Anthropocene, time of change, AI and automation. Some people look at it very fearful. John Hagel wrote a book on fear. I look at it differently. I see it as a new age of empowerment, especially for the people who are young today. And we'll talk about why. And the reason it's not scary is that even with all the AI and automation that is definitely coming in the 21st century, we're never going to run out of at least four things. Dreams to realize, problems to fix, people who need help, and people who want to make things better and help them. The interesting thing is that the education we have today addresses absolutely none of these, but we're going to address all of them with empowerment. And when I say empowerment, I mean something very specific. Empowerment is accomplishment with impact. I don't mean potential empowerment. I don't mean that someday you can do something. You are empowered when you can point to something and say, I did that and it made the world better. It comes from the beliefs that you have. We'll talk about those. The accomplishments in the real world that you do. A symbiosis with technology and teams, which is something new, and applying your own uniqueness to the world. So let's begin by reframing who the young people are. This is really important because we're all moving to becoming symbiotic with our technology. I call it symbiotic human hybrids. And this slide illustrates on the left with the blue that in so many places we're already there. In the 20th century, you would hardly do any of the things in that column without technology. I do all my reading on my iPhone. I have all the books that I've read in the last 10 years on there with my note. Uh, Nonfiction writing gets done with AI, especially in sports. Nobody would access information or do research or even calculate something or translate something without the help of technology. And we are collaborating here. This is the great example. Uh, and even agility and grit, which people vaunt as important things for people to have, machines do it better. So we need to not have them replace us, but become symbiotic with them. Symbiosis means that it benefits us. We benefit it, obviously, by making it better. And the two of us together are better than each of the parts individually. Now, the middle column is very interesting because those are things that are absolutely on their way to symbiosis. I thought debating was a human thing until I saw IBM Project Debater, where Watson Computer debates a human debater doing all the work, uh, doing the research, writing the opening statement, writing the rebuttals on the fly, and then the conclusion. 
And then they have a, a real debate and the computer almost wins and it will win in the future. All of the things from critical thinking to project management, to systems thinking, to connecting ideas, which we always needed teachers to do. Uh, now we have talk to books, which will connect 100,000 books in less than a second. Art, music, those are all done these days with technology in more and more instances. And even speaking and conversation and relating with robots that talk to people, especially accomplishing. And if you look at the final column, the column in yellow, those are things that many people think are essentially human and will be human forever. But I wonder if that's so totally true. I think they're already becoming symbiotic. Loving, for example, is something now that we can do at a much greater distance than we ever could. We used to write letters, but now we can have long distance relationships and loving relationships with people we rarely or never even see in person. So I think it's all moving to hybrids. And I look forward to this because I think it makes us better humans being symbiotic. Now, where are the young people going to live? these symbiotic young people. Well, in the past, we only had two places to live. We had Earth, of course, where we live, and we had our imaginations. And the people who lived only in their imagination were sort of considered a little strange or artistic or whatever, but now we have a new world called the cloud. And it's coming very fast. It's almost here. That's a, a view of, of uh, a theoretical view of Elon's Starlink. And what's interesting is that the cloud is a new way to instantiate your imagination. And in many cases, it's easier. In many cases, it's less expensive. Not in all, but building a pyramid on Earth is really a lot of work. Building a pyramid in the cloud in Second Life or in Roblox is very easy. So it's a new place for the young people to use their imagination. And of course, we're gonna have outer space and new planets as well. Beliefs are really important. Beliefs are at the root of everything we do or don't do. And my sense is that beliefs are changing from the generation of the 20th century that grew up in the 20th century. I call that the, the last pre-internet generation the world will ever see to the new generations, which are internet-based. Many years ago with a cultural anthropologist named Genevieve Bell, I put together this list of all the different things that where beliefs are changing. And we all know about technology, but privacy and property and personal relationships. And we've seen sexuality and race change, certainly in the United States and around the world. And you can look at the list and even time and space have changed a lot because now we can do things asynchronously and in many different places at the same time. So what's emerging in my view is a generational beliefs divide. And that is a very important divide that's more important, I think, than the digital divide that we talk about in terms of, of equipment. Because we can give people equipment, but it's much harder to change their beliefs. Yet, belief change is what creates a different future. And Guido pointed out to me that even when you do change your beliefs, which happens typically when you have an aha moment, there's still what he calls muscle memory that brings you back to doing what you did before. Now in the realm that I'm particularly interested in, and we're interested in with which is young people, the differences in beliefs I think are very stark. The people, from the 20th century, and now I'm generalizing, obviously, believed that kids couldn't accomplish much, that learning had to come first, that technology was just a tool, you could leave it at the door, that in-person was better, let's get back to being in-person, individual work, kids need knowledge and skills, and school is very important. Whereas we now have a generation that thinks no, we can. We can do a lot more than you think we can. Accomplishment comes first. Technology is a symbiotic part of us. Earth and cloud are equal. Teams and collaboration come first. We need empowerment and coaching from adults. And like my son, 
real world projects are better preparation for the future than is 20th century school. So I've put together a book that is now free online uh, called Beliefs for 21st Century Kids. We're going to publish it in hard copy as Digital Natives Rising that contains some of the thoughts that I think are important for the young people to have if they don't have them already, which many of them do. Things like, I have a unique set of dreams, passions, strengths, and capabilities that no other human has. I can understand my uniqueness and apply it to bettering my world in my own way. I have the power to create positive changes as an individual and even more powerfully in teams. I can and will take my dreams as seriously as I want to. My goal is to become a good, effective, world-improving person, doing the most good and least harm I can. I'll make my human and technology components work well together to solve problems. That's the symbiosis. If you want to see the whole book, there's much more. It's online for free at bit.ly. 2, capital A, capital G, capital R, 2, capital U, small k. So again, we have this map to guide us through all this breadth that I'm going to talk about today. The next set of things are the young people's world that you can read there. And this is really an interesting change of perspective because in the 20th century and before, we had what I call a world of experience. It was based on knowing what had come before because things didn't change very quickly. So if you'd seen things before and most things that happened before, you were wiser. You had more experience. Now, experience is overrated. That's what Kevin Kelly says, because we're on a new frontier. And the things that you had experience with may no longer be relevant. I had a conversation with a guy who could be, I don't know if he's attending here, but everybody probably knows his name, who said to me, all my experience tells me that, dot, dot, dot. And I don't think he was right because his experience was from the 20th century. So we're moving to a new frontier. And one of the things that characterizes this frontier is that we are no longer in a time of generational replacement. It used to be we would say to a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? That meant, who do you want to replace when they die? The jobs and the roles stayed more or less the same, and people grew up and took their places. That is really changing. Now we are in a time of continuous invention, when many of the old roles are going away, and the new roles are still being invented. Now, in that old world, we came to the conclusion that academic school was really, really important, which it was in the 20th century. Almost all of us here went through it. It was useful. And then we made an assumption that it was work for everybody, that if only everybody got that same academic education, it would be great. So we got the UN SDGs, everybody should get a quality education. We tried poor people and, and, and females and everybody who wasn't there. But it turns out that academic success is not universal. It's only for some. It works well for some people, which is actually a minority. So we need to ask, what is universal? What works for everybody? And the answer, I think, is real-world accomplishment. The answer is that everybody in the world, no matter who they are, can set a goal, big or small, for themselves and accomplish it and get there. So that's really what we need as the universal. And then what do we call these young people? We've called them kids or children or students or learners. This is in English, and some of you speak other languages, I know. But all of those terms put them on a lower level and us on a higher level, when we are really all people, and they are people who happen to be young. So we don't have a better term for that yet in English, but we need to all think of ourselves as being people. And the worst of it is 
when this is an old slide I found that I've been talking about for years, we don't think of them as people. We think of them as our pets. We say, sit and go here and do this and be obedient, follow me, and especially perform the tricks I taught you, which is what we do in school with testing. Okay, back to the map. There are two particular things that I think we need a reframing of because they're very important. The first one is learning. I think academic education's biggest problem is that it has learning as its goal instead of accomplishing. That is universal. That's what we do in academic education. We talk about learning. How much of it did we do? How can we measure it? Did it go away over the summer? But in truth, we learn, at least not, not the learning we do just when we look around, but we learn formally in order to accomplish useful things. So we need to reframe learning, I think, very importantly, from an end in itself, which is the academic view of learning, to a means of accomplishing. And if you focus on it as a means instead of a product, we get better results. So the old frame is learning is the product. That's the product of, of schools and colleges. We are in the learning business. No. In my view, in the reframe, it's a byproduct. The product is accomplishment. Second thing is skills. We've had trouble characterizing skills, which, what's basic, what's hard, what's soft. Recently, we've heard about what's 21st century skills. My way of reframing this is there are task-specific skills, and there are what I call the diamond skills, which are really the transferable lifetime capabilities. And this is a big list. And if you want to, you can take a screenshot of this list. I have put them into effective thinking, effective action, effective relationships, and effective accomplishment. You know, I'm not going to go into it. But the interesting part about this is that nobody has them all. They're all lifetime skills. And people have different combinations of these, and that's what makes us unique. That's why teams are important. It's because of the unique combinations of diamond skills that everybody brings to the table. So all this leads to our reframing the whole process of growing up. I call it growing up empowered. I want to talk about reframing a new 21st century journey of growing up. And the overall new frame for this, it's from being directed, which is really what we did to our young people for so long. We directed them as kids, we directed them as students to becoming empowered. And this is the visual. Somebody asked me recently, what's a visual, one visual for what you're talking about? It's this, in the 20th century, we worked really hard to put things into people, the past, our beliefs, our, our cultures, all these things. Now, I think what we want to do to help ourselves is take these individual humans who are born with so many possibilities and help them bring out the possibilities that are inside them. We have a crisis of imagination because we've stifled it for so long. So here's a frame for growing up. I call it far more empowering. The frame is to find the new beliefs, unique value, new connections, and new 21st century powers of each person. And that starts when you're young, but keeps going all your life. But you're doing that so that you can apply them to projects with positive impact and to meaningful work that will create and add value to humanity. And the reason you're doing that, the motivation for doing that, is to realize your positive dreams, to realize your dreams for yourself, for your family, for the world. That's something that we haven't been able to do with young people for a long time. But now, because of the new empowerment that we have, we can. We can start with you, with your dreams, the problems you care about and try to realize those dreams and fix those problems. We have a process, which is real world projects and accomplishments and lots of enablers, people, teams, beliefs, self-understanding, skills and, tech, and symbiosis 
that help that process or support that process and enable it. So what are the stages of growing up? Well, the first one is parenting and being parented. We all start out with parents or substitute parents if we're not in the same situation. And the overall frame for parenting, I think has been ownership. And I've heard so many people say, don't tell me how to raise my kid, which is essentially saying I own that kid. And legally in some ways they may, but what we really need to move to, to reframe to, is that you are the curator of that young person. It is your job to bring out what's in them, as we saw in that diagram. We need to reframe what people call the basics, because I hear all the time, yes, but kids have to know the basics, don't they? And in the past, those basics were reading and writing and arithmetic. We call them the three R's in English. And they were super important in the 20th century and still to some extent today. But moving forward 20 years, they're not going to be as important. New things are going to take their place as the symbiosis with technology makes the reading of today less and less important as a basic. It's not going away. Nothing goes away. But now we have to focus on accomplishment. I call it the ABCD loop or accomplishment loop. Accomplish a project. Better your world. Think about, reflect on how to do it better and then do it again over and over again. My good friend Esther Wojcicki has a wonderful acronym called TRIC. Trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. All things that we need to both give and receive more of. And she tells wonderful stories about trusting her kids and letting them have things and giving them her phone number and letting her grandkids go off and shop on their own. And those are so important for the future of our young people that I call them a basic. Another basic is we've got to start becoming used to change, being prepared for everything to change. There's lots of teachers who sat there like my teacher in college and had all his notes in front of him that he used every single year, same jokes, same everything. Uh, now, you can't do anything more than twice. You do it once to figure out how to do it and the second time to do it better. And then you move on. So things change continuously. And that's really important to get used to as people from the 20th century are not as used to as the young people of today. And the last one is a invention of mine, LEGO. You all know about the biggest toy company in the world, but I see it as love, respect, gratitude, and optimism. And those are four things that are just totally basic to any young person's growing up in my view. Now we can reframe the curriculum as well because We've been used to, in the old frame, subjects and classes, and this is a curriculum, was just a, a collection of, of classes and subjects that we had to study. We're moving, reframing to projects, to real-world projects. This is not just in school, it's in the business world, too, where we don't even see job descriptions anymore. We see project descriptions, and that's where we're going to start going. And what it means is that we don't just need a few curricula for the, all the different professions. We need 2 billion individual curricula because we have 2 billion or more kids. That is something that we could never do in the past, but we now can. Every young person can grow up with his or her own specific curriculum of projects that they choose, that they're interested in. So the school years, what we now call the school years, move from schools, which we have all over the world, and they're very much the same, no matter where they are, they all start out with basics in the early years, and then what I call the mess, math, English, science, social studies, or whatever your language is. We're gonna move from that to, I think, an alternative. And that alternative is what I call, not my invention, but this is a 20-year-old friend called empowerment hubs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those because I think that's going to be extremely important, whatever they're called in the future. 
The reason it's not going to be education, as we think of it today, is because we can't really reform it. People still want it for their kids. It was so good for the parents. Adults believe in its power to help. We know what it is because we all went through it. We don't want to experiment or parents don't want to experiment. Uh, there's a huge infrastructure. We have PISA. It's very self-protective. There's no consensus. And most importantly, when people get around to trying to reform it, the pressure is not for reform. It's for icing, incremental changes. We have an old stale cake, which is education, which is those the three R's in the mess. And we just put things on top of it. And those things could be technology, they could be social emotional, they could be anything that people are doing these days, but it doesn't change the old stale cake underneath. So here's our situation. In the 20th century, education was crucial. We all knew it was, and it worked. And so we all wanted to spread it. But now as we do that, we find that it's not meeting everyone's needs. And the reason it isn't meeting everyone's needs is that there are two big problems with education. It's very academic, which not everybody likes or can do, and there's no accomplishment associated with it, which is what everybody can do and what we really need. So aside from doing nothing, we have three options, I think. We can change it, we can enhance it, or we can offer an alternative. We already saw why changing it is so hard. There's a lot of conversations about the future of learning and education of the future, but I don't think it's gonna make much of a dent. I think that the academic education is just gonna go on for a long time and hopefully get eventually replaced as people vote with their feet. Enhancing it has mostly meant adding technology, a little bit social emotional. That's okay. I like adding technology and it may help, but it doesn't solve the problems of academic learning because most of the technology goes to academic learning. And it doesn't solve the problem of a lack of accomplishment because technology has not been very good at that yet. It may get there, I hope it does. So the alternative that I support is empowering kids via accomplishment. I think that's our best option. And I think that needs to become a side-by-side -side option that we offer parents and young people. They can vote, as I said, with their feet. And the venue for that, the place where that can happen, is what we call, or what I call, empowerment hubs. Again, this was not my invention. The name comes from a 20-year-old who wants to start one. It's an alternative for accomplishing with impact. It's better because the academic schools are a 20th century vision that focus on academic learning, mostly classes, maybe a few projects of, there's project-based learning, PBL, but that's really just a methodology for teaching the academic curriculum. It measures learning progress. It focuses on the individual. Technology is a tool. There may be mastery certification. That's another big thing these days in the academic world, but it's for later. It's not now, it's for when you grow up. And maybe, maybe there's some potential empowerment. But the hubs, empowerment hubs are a 21st century vision, I think, of what kids need. They focus on accomplishment with impact. They're mostly projects that the young people choose for themselves. We measure the impact, and we'll talk about how we do that. Focus on teams, networking, collaboration, with technology as a symbiotic part of the process, continuous real world accomplishment now during those years, not in the future, and leading to actual applied empowerment. So because this doesn't exist and it's new in the world, there are no ministries in any countries that support it. I've tried to get some countries to introduce it with no success. So with a few of my colleagues, we decided to form it ourselves. We have now formed the Global Ministry of Empowerment, Accomplishment, and Impact. That is something brand new that exists to support empowerment hubs worldwide. And if you want to start or build or join an empowerment hub, we will help you. We're not in business to earn money. 
We'll help you with the design and sharing and connecting and finding resources and people. Connecting people is one of the biggest things that I and we do. It works at all levels, primary, secondary, university, and also for adults. And there's multiple models, after school, inside school, alongside school, replacing schools that are right for different groups, parents and kids. So if you're interested in learning more about empowerment and empowerment hubs, you can contact us at ministryofeai.org or at my own email that I'll give you at the end. A couple of quick things that I want to add Assessment. Assessment's really important because so many people focus on it. Grades, what are the grades? Ranking, which is one of the worst things we do to young people. Degrees, we thought these are really important. The reframe is what did you do? Show me something that says last year that was bad or it didn't exist. Next year, now, because of what I and my team did, it's much better. That is what I call measurable positive impact or MPI. We don't have to compare them. We don't have to rank them. We just have to have MPI. And until you do, a project is not complete. A word about higher education. I have a big reframe of this. Right now, higher education is a credential provider. You get in, you go through, whatever classes you come out with a degree, that's the credential. A lot of employers use that credential as their first cut as to whether they're going to look at you or not. I don't think that's really the function that it's performing or should perform. I think what happens is that we all, in most of the world, go to school locally through what in the United States is high school, everybody has a name for it, through a certain age, it's where you happen to live. And then we do a huge sort. We sort you into peer groups. We say, well, you belong in Todai, or you belong at Harvard or Stanford or whatever the the top school is, or another school, depending on who you are. And we try, and the admissions officers try to put together peer groups because peer interaction, when you are in that very formative stage of life, is what's extremely important. And we all know that we make our good lifelong friends in college or university. And so in some ways, getting in and being sorted is even more important than getting out. And finally, this is, I know, near and dear to Guido's heart, we're talking about work. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this here, although I've thought about it and I'm happy to talk about it more. But basically, we're switching from a time when people did jobs. You had to get a job. That was what you were doing. That's why you grew up. That's why you got educated. To thinking of it in a new frame of adding unique value. Thinking about becoming, understanding how you are unique and what unique value you can add to a team or a group or a project. And once you think of it in that way, it becomes a lot easier to find something meaningful because you're doing something where you know, you know that you can uniquely add value through who you are, through your own dreams and strengths and passions. So we've come to the end and I just want to leave you with something called the nugget because very rarely do you ever hear or do I have I ever heard in the hundred teachers that I had said, you're going to forget most things, but this is what I want you to remember for the rest of your life. And this is the nugget from this talk. It's helpful to reframe our young people's world and growing up in it. There's a model for doing this. You can take screenshots of these. I recommend that you do. There is a model now that's the find, apply, realize model. There's a map. And the frames within that map are very clear where we need to go. There's even a new taxonomy, which I don't have time to talk about. But again, take a picture for growing up in three phases, the starting, what I call the starting phase, the expanding phase, and the realizing phase, realizing hopefully your dreams. And finally, 
we have something better to move to. So we're not just saying things need to change, we're saying we need to move in a particular direction. So given all that, let's go do it. This is my email. I look forward to hearing from as many of you as possible. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mark. That was a, a, an amazing story.